You're listening to the When Life Hands You Lennon's Podcast. But in an entry-level film production, it's one strike and you're out. You're fired. I'm not calling you back. If your goal today is to make a basket, we're going to make that basket. The minute you create something, as soon as it's made tangible, you have a copyright in it. How do I get our guys to sound that big, you know, that full when they do the harmonies? And I'm your host, Lennon Seahawk. Let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of When Life Hands You Lennons. I am very, very excited and honored for this week's episode. Miss Camille Barbone is an industry veteran. And by that, I mean she was Madonna's first manager and basically kickstarted her career into what it is today. And in this episode, Miss Camille talks about all of her industry experience about running a studio and working on productions and working with label executives and being mentored and moving out to San Francisco and working with her family to learn and kind of solidifying her career. We also talk about how we're both kind of on the no bullshit train where we mean business and we don't want any misinformation out there and all we want to do is spread factual, correct information on the music business because there are a lot of talking heads in the music business and there are a lot of people that are out there that are taking advantage of independent artists and artists in general. And it's unfortunate because it ruins the music business for those who are very credible, like myself and Miss Camille. And it also ruins it for those who are aspiring to be in the business because they hear about these scams and, and cruel people who are out taking advantage of these people. And it d- discourages them from even advancing their careers and makes it very difficult for them to trust anybody. So we talk about different kinds of deals, and we talk about being an artist manager, and we talk about Camille's uh, experience in the field as well, and all of that fun stuff. And Camille is a wealth of information. She, like I said earlier, she is uh, a music industry veteran, so she has stories upon stories to share for her expertise and all kinds of great information. So... I'm very excited for this episode, and before we dive in, I want to remind you to sign up to my email list, which is in the show notes below, or you can also head to my newly developed website, lennonseahawk.com, and sign up there as well. It helps me notify you when new episodes like this are live. I would also appreciate a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, because it greatly helps the podcast grow, and I love hearing your reviews and how I can make the show better as well. There is a guest request form in the show notes below as well. So if you or somebody you know would be a good guest for the show, I'd appreciate it if you'd fill it out and I will reach out to be a, for you to be a guest for the show. Lastly, I want to plug my Instagram, which is just at Lennon Seahawk, L-E-N-N-O-N-C-I-H-A-K, which will also be in the show notes below. I post updates and kind of things I'm working on as well there. So without further ado, let's dive into my conversation with Camille Barbone. Camille, thank you so much for being on the show and taking the time to be uh, out of your busy schedule to be on the show. I really appreciate that. Um, So why don't you just tell us who you are and how you got into music and kind of give us a little bit of a backstory uh, as a founding, as a foundation. No problem. No problem. Um, Hi, Lennon. First, thanks so much for having me on the uh, podcast. Um, I just am such a huge fan of of yours and also all the people that come out of Full Sail. What a bunch of great individuals and assets to the uh, entertainment business, music business specifically. Really an honor to be involved. Um, I've been in the music business for pretty much all of my adult life. That's about 35 years. Um, started out in, in uh, the, the early 70s, and uh, I've just dated myself, but that's okay too. Um, I, I didn't know anything about the music business when I was growing up. All I knew was I loved music, and I was a bit of an audiophile even before it was, it was fashionable. I would check the charts, um, I would buy albums, I would try and pick what the single would be. I was in love with the idea of music and the Beatles were big, 
and all my girlfriends and I would hang around and we'd watch, we'd listen to the Beatles and they'd read, we'd read the liner notes on the backs of albums. And they all talked about being, uh, John Lennon's girlfriend or Ringo Starr's girlfriend. I wanted to be George Martin's kid because I figured I would be on the inside track and I would know what the hell was going on in the music business and I could be close to the Beatles. I could watch them record and create. To me, the creation was the most, I think, inspiring thing and the most amazing thing to me that some people just have these brains that enable them to, to write songs that mean something to masses of people. It was, it was pretty astounding. Um, so here I am, 18 years old, and I decide I'm going to visit my cousins in, uh, in California because I know they're in the music, the music business. They're both big engineers. And I'm talking about one worked for A&M um, uh, Records. The other one worked for Columbia. And they did every major album as engineers, from uh, the, the Osmonds to... Carlos Santana to Barbara Streisand. I mean, they were involved in the thick of it. Uh, so I, I arrived and my cousin said, you want to come to work with me? And I said, I would love that. And he got dressed and he put jeans on and he had a great shirt on and he had sunglasses and it was 7 p.m. at night. And we were going to work. And it was like, wow, this is like the job of a dream, right? So we show up there and he, he parks me on this beautiful leather couch in this cool air conditioned space and I don't know what he's going to do and I see this small guy come in and they shake hands and then he goes into the uh the booth and it turns out that it's Carlos Santana and that he's about he's about to lay down some of his lead tracks and solos and the track is Oye Como Va and I am sitting there San Francisco I'm sitting there and and I am in awe I am just watching and, and, and dealing with the process and my cousin is behind me on this gigantic console and I am absolutely transported into what turned out to be a fantasy land that I wanted to be a part of and we hung out with Carlos afterwards he went back in the studio he was a delightful guy it was all fabulous and when I left California, I knew I wanted to be in the music business beyond anything else. I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to, go to college. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to be in the music business. So Columbia Records is where my cousin worked. So I figured that would be the place to go. And I applied to Columbia Records and there were no openings. So I took a job at CBS Radio in the hopes that a slot would come available at Columbia. And um, I, would, uh, I would get it, you know, and sure enough, a slot came available as the manager of new release coordination for Columbia and Epic and Associated Labels. And I applied and I got the job. Unbeknownst to me, it was probably gr the grad school of record business jobs because what I learned were how the 28 different departments got together to make a recording and release a recording and market a recording and get it out to the radio stations and promote it. And my job was to keep every one of these departments on schedule. So I learned how each department worked. I worked with the, uh, with a &R, so that means I worked with the artists. I worked with the radio promotion men because sometimes they needed advanced copies to get to the radios, the radio stations and DJs. It was the most amazing education and experience anyone who wanted me in the music business could have. And I was lucky enough to get it. Uh, so I, I stayed at Columbia for a few years and I learned everything that I could possibly learn. I held a similar job at Polygram. Uh, and then I held an A&R position at Buddha Records. And then I went on my own. And Buddha Records at that point in time was owned by Arista. So I had a lot of dealings with Arista as well. But throughout this entire learning process, the thing that was most uh, important to me was the job I wanted. I was exposed to a lot of them. And that's what a lot of, a lot of kids today don't know all the different jobs you can, you can get in the music business. Of course, they're the heavy ones. You know, everybody wants to be an A&R. Everybody wants to be in promotion. And all those things are the, the ones with the sizzle. But there's so many incredible jobs like the one I had that you could get that would 
give you such a, an insider's view of the industry and you would know how it would how it works and you would understand how artists are involved in their own careers and managers work with promotion people and how everybody kind of gets together to make superstars and in some instances icons. So I was pretty well prepared when I decided I wanted to go out on my own and the thing that always attracted me was the way that managers interacted with the record labels. It seemed like they had all the juice. It seemed like they had all the power because they represented the artists. They were closest to the artists. And in, in some instances, they do have a, uh, probably the most power and sometimes too much power when we all know managers sometimes go wild and do some pretty bad things. But, right. ge but generally speaking, you know, managers are responsible for everything working in an artist's career and they're also responsible for everything that goes wrong. Uh, and then the artist, of course, gets the, the juice for when everything goes right. But that's what being a behind the scenes kind of um, entity is all about. And, and management for me was, was that I loved being close to the, to the power and the power is the artist. I loved doing whatever I had to do to make that artist's career uh, grow. Um, and each time I would see an action uh, take hold and my artist would, in would increase in popularity, it was probably the best feeling I'd ever experienced in my life. So I, I, was, I was very much hooked really early on. So knowing that, I, I absorbed all I could possibly absorb at labels and then I was finally ready to go off on my own. And the idea was to become a manager and to have a studio. Now I have to tell you, flying by the seat of my pants, okay? No backers, no money, just this mad desire to be in the music business and be an artist manager. My, my years at the labels gave me a lot of good contacts. And I knew that if I had put up a small studio, people would come. And sure enough, I, I scrimped, I scraped, it saved, I borrowed, I pled, I begged, I did everything I possibly could do to get enough money to put a very basic studio together. Um, and I did it. And um, immediately, Blue Sky Records, uh, Johnny and Edgar Winter started coming. Uh, David Johansson, at that time it was the New York Dolls, and then later on Buster Point Dexter. Um, people of that era, Melba Moore. I was in this this building on the, the, the west side of Manhattan in the, in the garment district probably one of the most dangerous areas of New York at that point in time, right next to Port Authority. And there was a, a, a building called the Music Building. And it was 12 floors of rehearsal and, record, and, and small recording studios. But no one in that building um, was involved with mainstream music business people. I was the only one. So I took a small studio in there and it was my first studio and it's how I launched Gotham Sound. I, I eventually was able to get an entire floor uh, on the building and it's thanks to the support I got from all the record label people that I knew and I, and, and I started Gotham Sound which was my first state of the art studio. Why did I want a studio? Because as a manager I was mentored by someone who said you have to own as much as you can to cut down on your overhead because artists cost money. You have to record with them. They have to rehearse. They have to have a place to uh, hang their hat creatively. And that stayed with me. Um, I was very fortunate to be, be uh, mentored uh, by a very successful uh, comedy manager, uh, Jack Rollins. And he managed Billy Crystal and, um, oh, who was it? Uh, uh, Robert uh, Robert Cohen, Lenny Bruce. He did. He did, He had. Uh, he had. Um, who's it? Uh, the woman. I can't even think of her name right now. Anyway, lots of people, all in mainstream comedy. It was pretty exciting. Joan Rivers was was one of his people, um, and he started to talk to me about how to manage artists and what to do with artists and how you had to deal with artists. And I learned a lot from him. I sat in his office, he smoked a big gigantic cigar behind his gigantic desk, and he just taught me how to become a manager. I took everything he earned, he lo I learned from him, and I earned a lot of credit for sitting there for hours and hours, and he just beat the crap out of me, pretended he was the A&R guy, he pretended he was the artist, he showed me how to pitch things. He really gave me a lot of, a lot of experience before I even hit the street. 
And so I was ready to pick up artists and I started to do that. And um, in that studio is, is where I discovered, developed and managed Madonna. Uh, and that was uh, the early 80s. And um, it, it, it launched my career, it launched her career, it launched everyone's career. I think I've probably held every possible position I could in the music business, all legal, I might add. I have, I have managed, of course, I have produced music, I have uh, promoted huge concerts, I was responsible for the entire gospel segment of Woodstock 94. Uh, it was fabulous. It was, uh, we, we had amazing people. We had Shaka Khan and we had Thelma Houston and um, Cece Peniston and Phoebe Snow and Michael Lang, who had uh, Woodstock 94, wanted the gospel segment to be the Sunday morning religious moment for the crowd, you know. So I've had experiences that I, I consider myself so lucky to have had through, through my life as a manager. Um, management for me is probably the most exciting aspect of, of the music industry. Artist development is, I think, paramount uh, to, an, to the business. And it used to be a time when the record labels did it, but now it's really left to the managers and no, and no one else. Um, it's, it's depending upon the type of artist, it's pretty costly too. Um, if you're starting from scratch, um, you have to get a band, you have to, if, if the artist isn't a writer, you have to find the material, you have to do the staging, you have to do the costuming, you have to work with production people. If you're going to make a recording, uh, and of course you're going to have to, uh, you have to work with staging people in order to put a live performance together. And management is at the core of all this. So for me, you have to know a lot about a lot of different businesses in order to be a manager. And um, I have spent my entire career learning and I continue to learn. Now with digital and, and the way music is, is uh, delivered online, um, it's, it's another learning curve for me. It's pretty exciting and um, you know I, I really am one of the lucky ones in terms of having the, ex the experiences that I've had in the past because it enables me to understand a little bit more the application, how you take digital music now and you warm it up. You, may, you still have to make it personable. You still have to m make it be a one-on-one -on -one experience. Uh, and, and I mean, there's not a lot of live performance anymore. There are major concerts and in, in smaller towns, um, there are still the, the venues, but the major cities like New York, LA, it's really hard to go to clubs and see new talent. Um, it's mostly online now. It's mostly, I mean, I, I troll YouTube and I look for new talent all the time. And it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, another thing that I think is different now uh, than when I first started out in the music business is the fact that the industry was more of a filter when I began my career. In other words, the record labels were the gatekeepers. They told the radio stations, hey, these are the songs and the artists you get to pick from in order to put them on the air. Now, because of the internet, everything is out there. I read an article that recently that 40,000 new tracks are uploaded daily onto the internet. That's a gigantic amount of, of data, of music. Sadly, a gigantic percentage of that is not, it's not commercial, not viable, whatever you want to call it. Um, a lot of people have dreams. I wish everybody's dreams could be to, could come true, but a small amount of people have the, the amount of talent that you need in order to cut through and become a big star. So the music business now is a very, it's, it's kind of a free for all and we've got to find the talent as opposed to the talent finding us. Um, it, that push pull thing that we all hear about in marketing. Uh, you, you, you had artists pushing their talent towards you uh, when, when you were an A&R, when you were at, at a record company, and now you have to pull it off of the internet and you have to look for it. It's, it's podcasts like yours and other people's that, that help a great deal because you help us sort through all of, of the talent or lack thereof that's out there. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I love the business now. I miss the old business. Uh, I think what, what's most important now is that 
that the talent that we're hearing and we're seeing gets supported, uh, especially in this time with COVID-19. Uh, you know, I know everybody's jumping online, everybody's trying to do concerts, everybody's trying to do, we have to support uh, the arts community because the arts community keeps us sane in times like this. If you go back all the way in time, and I've read about this, what, what, what entertainers did during World War, World War II, what entertainment did for us uh, in terms of protesting the Vietnam War, what it did during 9-11. And, you know, we have a very important role um, in, in the fabric of the United States, in the fabric of, of the world, uh, in, in terms of entertaining, in terms of giving people moments of peace uh, when they really need it, uh, a chance to escape. So I'm honored to be involved, in, and right now, you know, as a coach and as a consultant in the, in the music industry, um, I'm working very hard to find ways to continue to give uh, artists a chance to grow, um, even during this. And it's very challenging and it's very exciting, and, um, you know, we're, we're putting think tanks together for, for people to come up with ideas and new ways of doing things. I think the Elton John... Uh, performance with uh, Alicia Keys and, and uh, Backstreet Boys, I think that did, they did a great job in, in showing that we can deliver entertainment, even, even in a, 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 a pandemic, you know. So it's, it's pretty exciting uh, times uh, for everyone to be as resourceful as they possibly can. It's it's definitely an interesting time with the pandemic going on, and it's it's kind of unprecedented in all of our lives. We just haven't nobody living currently has seen such a crisis like this, where everything is kind of shutting down, and especially in the entertainment industry, like it's just come to a complete halt. And I spoke with uh, somebody last week on the podcast, and he was telling us about how it's really impacted the live entertainment industry. And he was a manager for like a comedy, uh, comedy group, and all kinds of other musical acts around the around the country. But I'm so glad that you're on the show because you remind me a lot of me. You want to learn a little bit about everything. And that's exactly how I am. Since I went to Full Sail and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I graduated and got my degree in music production. And ultimately, that's what I want to do. But I know and knew when I was in school that there are so many other things that keep the music business rolling, such as artist management, music publishing, songwriting, uh, live events, and, and you know all the moving parts that are going on, and studio management, and all kinds of other things. So those types of things keep me going, and I'm learning a little bit about everything. I've worked as a publicist. I've worked, I'm currently a journalist. I'm doing the podcast to keep up on my audio production chops and, and connect and chat with people like you who are considered industry veterans and have learned and contribute so much every day to the music industry. Um, and I've learned so much over the years, and that's going to help me in the coming years to when I start developing myself as an artist and continue to work as a musician. I've been one for 14, 15 years now that I'm going to know everything about the business. I'm going to know as much as I possibly can rather than just going into the music business as an artist and not knowing anything about songwriting, copyrights, music licensing, uh, sync licensing, uh, what what types of things you can do with the, with the master rights and the songwriting rights and all those types of things. So you remind me a lot of me uh, because you want to learn a little bit about everything. Well, you know, you don't have a choice. If, if you, you know, in terms of the entertainment industry, you know, we're dealing with the land of 360 deals. Now, when I, again, when I first started out, and I'm sorry taking you down trips to memory lane, but it's, it's good comparative, you know. You, record labels you used to just make their money off of music sales, pre-recorded music sales, whether it be a vinyl, whether it be a single, whether it be an eight-track, a CD, whatever it is, they, they made money by selling it. All well and good. Now we have the 360 deal. And the 360 deal, is, as you well know, entitles the record label to a piece of all the, the income streams that might possibly exist for an artist. So it's publishing, it, if they're doing film and television, if they get endorsements, if they do live performance, there's all a piece of the pie. Now, the, the record industry, music industry is basically saying, 
we're going to give you longer deals now because we've got a lot more we're going to do and we're going to work very closely with you in terms of artist development. Sadly, that isn't the case. Sadly, it still falls on the personal manager, but at least you have a, a, a compatriot. You have a counterpart at the label that maybe is handling film and TV or sync licensing or any of things that might possibly um, transpire in a 360 deal. So you have to know what's going on if you want to be in this business and a, and a school like Full Sail or uh, the Mirror Program at St. Petersburg College, they, they can do so much in, in, in that period of time. They can do just so much. Really, when you get out on the street, when, when you start to interact and, and you learn, as you're doing, you said you were a publicist, you said you were a, you know, music production, you, we learn by doing. And, and we take what we learn in formal education, like Full Sail, and then we have to kind of decipher it and we have to apply it in, in real time and in the real world. And that sometimes becomes very shocking for, for young people that are getting into the business. They don't know how to make the transition, you know? But there are certain, there are certain positions in the music industry that require such an extraordinary amount of, of information. I know I have to be able to read a contract. I'm not a lawyer and I don't give legal advice, but I want to sit down with a lawyer and I want to understand exactly what's going on. I also want to educate my, my clients. I don't believe in, in clients being in the dark. I don't think artists are given enough credit and, or given enough latitude to learn more about the business and sometimes it puts them at a serious disadvantage. There's that syncophantic uh, thing that goes on sometimes when, when a, a, the, the industry wants to strip an artist of any of their abilities, they basically want to make them helpless uh, because you're controlling power. I believe that, that artists need to be educated as much as everyone else about how this business works. They need to know what happens when, when someone licenses their song for a film. Maybe some artists don't want that information, but most do or need it on down the line. Some people, sometimes they're just too damn busy as well. Um, and, and we get that too. But there are those moments in time, and I've spent many, many a moment, 12 o'clock midnight, 4 o'clock in the morning, just shooting the, the, the shit. Am I allowed to curse? Shooting the shit. Thanks. Shooting the shit with, with artists and, um, and talking about how the business works. And I was always shocked about what they didn't know. I've been on the road with, with bands. I was on the road with, with Seven Dust for a while. I, I, I've gone on tours, and there's a lot of time to talk, and there's a lot of time to educate um, artists about how this business works. They, too, need to know as much as they possibly can about, their, about what's going on in their career. They, don't, they maybe don't need to know how a publishing deal works, but they sure need to know who their publisher is, what their publisher is doing to help them, how their publisher is developing their careers as songwriters or recording artists. Um, so I'm always on a quest to educate. How about you? Same. Uh, that's exactly why I started the podcast and exactly why I do a lot of the articles that I do for journalism, aside from like the music reviews that I love doing and listening and finding new music. But that's one of the big reasons why I started the podcast is because I see so many artists who are pitching me for music and they just don't understand what exactly these all these things that happen, like how to formulate a, a good email pitch to a publicist or a journalist. And they don't understand the kind of the moving parts in the music industry. Uh, there was a metaphor that I, that I often quote and say that the music industry is, is like a football field. And a lot of people only look at the first 10 yards. They, it's, there's so many, there's 90 yards after that. There's so many other things to look at outside of those 10 yards. And a lot of artists that I come in, songwriters that I come into contact with, they just don't understand what, how big the music industry is. And if you don't understand a lot of these moving parts, you can get completely swallowed up and taken advantage of. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, there, there are, uh, there were instances in the past where, where artists have been severely damaged financially. Um, be, be, because they didn't understand what was going on, or they trusted in the in, in the wrong individual. I mean, you you're, you liken it to a football field. Sometimes I liken it to the Wild West. 
you know, there's, there, there's a lot of marauding going on and raiding going on sometimes. And it's hard, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of power to be, to be had. And it's, it's very difficult. Sometimes people get swayed by it. So, you know, I, when I coach and, and consult, I make sure that when artists are signing long-term agreements, they know who they're working with. They understand exactly what the dynamic is going to be between them, what that individual is responsible for. Um, you know, I, I believe firmly in the need for an artist development team. I don't think uh, a manager can do it himself or herself. I think we need a publicist. We need a great record producer. You need a good business manager that, that is, is primarily nothing more than an accountant that knows tax law and knows how to protect the money and assets of the artist. Um, you, need, you need a good booking agent. Uh, you need a good entertainment attorney. You need these people. That's your panel as an artist. And with that panel, and back to your football field, that's your line of defense. You know, they're going to protect you and they're going to get you a, a, across the goalpost to, to your, your smash hit record, your smash hit, hit career. I think it's really, it's really important uh, that, that artists understand they're not expected to do this alone. You know, um, your podcast, perfect example of an opportunity for, for young people, maybe in Wisconsin, or not in any of the music centers to get a big dose of what the real music business is all about. Um, it's a lot of dreams, you know, and, and they usually, these kids usually have to move to the big city in order to start to make some connections, get some traction in their business. But the, the business now is so multifaceted. Uh, the business now requires a, a real deep understanding of, of uh, crossover, and, 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 you know, multifaceted uh, careers. I, I think uh, just, just the fact that we're dealing with so much content for the Netflixes and the Hulus and, and, and all those platforms dictates that there needs to be more songs written, there needs to be better songs written, um, and somebody has to wade through all of the the garbage to find the gems. You know, that I, I have a few music supervisors as, as friends and they are inundated constantly with material and sadly only a small percentage is even worth their time to listen to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the one downfall of, of the internet is somebody is going to have to be quality control here. And, and I, I use my, my staff and I, we all get together and we listen to as much as we have to listen to and we do it together or some of us take 10 and then come back with, with the ones we think we should all listen to. But we have a process that enables us to get through more material, to find those gems, to find the people that really um, deserve to be on uh, the best playlists or um, on terrestrial radio or or maybe an, being given an opening act slot for one of the big players. Um, there's, it's, it's that that I think is, is, is most important. I think when a Billie Eilish comes, comes to the surface, I'm, I'm so relieved, you know? I, I'm, I'm so happy she's effortlessly talented. Um, and, and, and I believe that the way she handled her career, um, she has two parents that were in the music industry, so she's not naive about this business. Um, but I think that, that was a sweetheart rollout for a new artist. And, and I'd be hard pressed to think about anybody else. You know, I mean, the, the, if, if you go back a few years, I could maybe liken it to how Nora Jones came to be. Um, it was so organic and so so beautifully within the pocket of that musical genre. Um, people just took to it effortlessly, and and I, I think that that's that's pretty spectacular, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
I wanted to talk to you about because you mentioned like music supervisors and then you mentioned you have a few friends who are music supervisors. And that's something that I ultimately would like to, to get into because uh, the job that I currently am at, we just launched a music licensing course. It's called Hip Hop in Sync, uh, where we, we enlisted one of the most successful, if not the most successful person in hip hop music, independent hip hop music to do sync licensing. And he completely lives 100% on his sync licensing income. And I believe it. I mean, you can make a lot of money. He has over a thousand sync placements. So he is just doing incredibly well and doing very well. And he shared some of his tactics on how to get into contact with music supervisors and what they do and sync agents and all those kinds of things. But what do you see uh, in your experience and from your friends, depending on what shows they work on and genres of music they tend to work with, what do you see? How do artists get in front of sync agents and music supervisors to get their music placed in TV shows? The mantra, you have to start out with the mantra that rejection gives you energy. That's the first thing. Absolutely. It, it, there, it, it's, it's not an, an easy, easy pitch. It's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta get yourself into a place where you can start to get a few of them on the phone. But I will tell you this, that if you just get traction, a little bit of traction, uh, word gets out. I think the most important part about, uh, sync licensing and working with music supervisors is to not waste their time. And, and that was my rule whenever I pitched to A&R people too. I didn't pitch things that I knew they, they, they would want. I would find out what they would want. And I think that's, when I talk to my friends that are music supervisors, time is the most valuable uh, component for them. They just don't have enough time and they know they're missing great songs, but there's just no way that they can get around it. So what I try to do when I work with people that get involved with, with music supervision and pitch for TV and film is I say, you, you have to have a pointed pitch, meaning you have to know what entity is in production, what TV show, what film, what specifically are they looking for, who's doing, who the director is, who the music supervisor is, is there a back door you can go to? And I think this is the crucial part. You can find, you, you've got to find back doors. Going through the same door everyone else goes through, we all know what happens when a crowd tries to get out of one door, right? It, there's a big jam and it doesn't work. So what you have to do is, and, and they talk about this, my, my friends talk about this all the time. It's, it's going in a back door. It's finding someone else in, in the company that knows the music supervisor or the editor that's working on the film or, or the production uh, assistant that's working on the TV show. It's somehow kind of manipulating your way in so you get an opportunity to talk, but you have one chance and you better make sure you use that time wisely. You better make sure what you're pitching is absolutely relevant to what they're looking for and that it's good quality and it's a great master and it's, it's ready to go. I know some people that work to a point where they actually have the sync license ready to go. Wow. So if the music supervisor says yes, it's push the button, the, the, the sync license is on its way, sign it, happy, next. You know, you, it, it really requires A-type personalities, music, music supervisors, as well as the people that pitch to them. I think it takes a little bit of time uh, for you to get a reputation of reliability, meaning, okay, if Camille's calling me, I know she's not going to waste my time. If, if Lennon's calling me, I know he's not going to waste my time. I know he's going to come with a, with a piece of music that will either be relevant for what I, I'm doing or for something that I might want to be doing because he knows my taste, you know? So it, it's, it's a very personal business. I think it's relationships. I think it's understanding who the music supervisors are, what they do, what they've done in the past, where do they live, uh, you know, I, I'm a firm believer of researching whoever you're going to have a meeting with. I don't go into a meeting cold. I go to a meeting, understand where they live, you know, 1.2 children, do they have animals where, you know, I want to know all of it because I want to be able to interact with these people in such a way where I, sh I, I shorten the time for them to trust. And, and the trust is well-founded. 
as well, because all of this research should be done from a sincere point of view, not a manipulative point of view. So, you know, sync licensing is an extraordinary way to make what I call passive income, okay? It's passive. You do, you do your pitch, you get your license, and it's done. Now, what's going on online with, with the royalties that are applied to sync licensing is, is, is interesting now. People are not understanding how to get paid online. Are you finding that? Are you finding that people are putting their music up there and not finding, and even though their music's being, being played, are they seeing royalties, not finding any royalties? What, what's the feedback you're getting on the street? Yeah, so I've I've seen a lot of artists. I just don't think they understand. I think it comes down to the promotion. I release an album. I'm not making any money. Well, that's because you didn't push it. You have like 50 streams on Spotify. You have maybe one or two on Apple Music, but you don't have any. You don't have any. You have maybe 300 fans on or followers on Instagram, and 150 of them are family. You know, so you don't really have, they don't really have true fans, so they don't have anybody to really engage with their music, which then listen to it and then up their streaming revenue. So there's really no promotion behind it. They just release music and expect it to be picked up by the algorithms and Spotify and Apple Music. And that's, that's just not the case because there's so many other artists that are doing so much more to, to, you know, get engaged with their fans and grow their, their streaming. Um, but and a, a lot of them are just like kind of like a lack of understanding of what a copyright is. Like some people don't even know how to copyright a song. Uh, a lot of people don't understand like what a royalty is. What what kind of royalties are you making? You know, how do you collect these royalties? Like, you know, who's your publisher? Uh, BMI. BMI is not a publisher. They're right. performing oh, rights. You know, so it, it's just those types of very small misconceptions that people just don't understand. And that's why I've done some big articles on EDM.com with an entertainment lawyer to kind of break down like the top five reasons why you need to copyright your music. Many of my consulting gigs are people wanting to start publishing companies that don't really get a grasp of, of what publishing is all about. So when we're talking about sync licenses and we're talking about mechanical licenses and now neighboring rights royalties. There's so many different ways to, um, to earn and there's also so many different organizations that are taking a piece of your royalties now because of the way uh, the internet is laid out and, and the, the, the way certain DSPs, digital service providers, um, are collecting and others aren't. So it's, it's, it's a big mystery. And, and too often I think what happens when it, it becomes very convoluted is they just walk away from it in the hopes that it will go away. But it won't. And, and your point about promotion, how do you cut through? It's what we're, what we're talking about here. How do you differentiate yourself uh, online? How do you make sure your social media presence is, is positioned in such a way where when you drop a new track, people are actually listening to it and moving it along and, and getting other people to hear it. You know, we, we, we need grassroots marketing on the digital level. And, and, and someone like, you know, someone like Billie Eilish did it. She did, that was, that was from zero to 60 in 10 seconds. And it was, it was beautifully, beautifully executed. Um, I think also what goes on is many of these, these, in quotes, digital marketing companies come up and they don't do anything except take, pe take people's money. Oh, yeah. So there, there's, there's that too. I'm going to put, I'm going to put your music on here. I'm going to put your music on there. Yeah, you're going to put your music on there, but will anybody hear it is the question. So, uh, you know, we, we have to be very careful with who we work with. Uh, we have to be very careful with, with, um, the, our, our assets. I mean, it costs money to promote. It's, it's a very, very costly thing for these young artists. Uh, fortunately, so many of them are so gifted uh, in, in social media, they grew up with it, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's easier for them for, than, than someone in their, in their 30s that, that's trying to get some traction. Uh, they may be great songwriters, and I'm not an ageist, but you know the, the the truth of the matter is, you definitely have to um, 
you have to learn about social media and you have to understand how to work it, you know, or you have to find people that do. I just had somebody on the podcast a uh, the, uh, couple weeks ago, about a month ago, uh, Heather Bright, and she was telling us how she was telling me how uh, she is very focused on producing her own music, and she started her own independent record label, and she has her own music that she's releasing through her her label, and she spent a lot of money to promote these her first couple of releases and the one of them she hired uh one of those promotion companies for playlisting and it, this recommendation actually came through a friend so she's like okay some one of my friends recommended this company to me i'm gonna you know trust them because why would a friend of mine recommend a scammy company well she spent thousands of dollars on promotion through this and nothing happened like nothing she got no playlist placements and he literally and he knew that when they jumped on a phone call with him they're like what's going on he just flat out took the money and didn't do anything i see that so so often and that's why i'm always very hesitant to like when i'm seeing these artists asking about like oh i want to get into playlists and when people are so focused on playlists on spotify they get it in their head that spotify is the only way that they're going to earn revenue and that's the only way they're going to make a living. And then they get caught up into this and like, Oh, when the, the, they jump on the first opportunity, they're like, Oh, I can get you on people's new music Friday, or I can get you on this rap caviar playlist. And they just, Oh, I'm down. And they just, where do I sign? And that's, that's dangerous and can cost artists thousands upon thousands of dollars. Yeah. In the old days, it was the, the, the same scam existed. It, it only existed with indie radio promotion people. And, and, and when terrestrial radio, before there was some, some uh, policing of, of it, you know, it was really easy to put, put a song on a slot for a couple of days and then pull it right off, you know, and, and the independent promotion people, along with the DJ, would split some money and that would be the end of it. Well, we've got that same kind of thing going on with playlist curation now. My generally, I got to say, as a coach and a consultant, I spend so much time vetting people before my clients get involved. My, my job is to, is to save them heartache and to save them money and to save them time. You know, so what I try and do is I try and make sure that they're involved with reputable people. The problem that, that exists sometimes is there are too few reputable people for, for the need. You know, so, I, you know, you, you have to... Con I continually try to develop a, a, uh, a list of resources that I know I can trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the most valuable asset that I have, is a list of people that I know if I call them up and I say, look, they're gonna listen to me, I'm gonna say, there's this young kid, she really needs you, I think it would be a good match, take a meeting with her, see what you can do. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I know if it does go down and they do work together, that it's going to be fair, it's going to be reputable, and the most important thing, they're going to get proportionally what they're paying for. Now, and, and let me tell you, these are the same people that would say, no, I really can't pick up this artist, Camille, I just don't hear it. They'd be that honest to say that. You know, and, and that's very important. It's, it's, the, it's the money that kind of, twist people's brains a little bit to say, oh, you're a hit, you're a smash, I'm going to make you a star, and then nothing can possibly happen except that person is enriched by the money this poor individual is paying. You know, a lot of people lose a lot of money that way. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not cruel with get a day job, but there are just some people that are more talented than others. As you well know, Lennon, you've got to be pretty much a, a triple, if not a quadruple threat. You've got to be able to perform. You've got to be able to vocalize. You've got to be able to, to write songs or have access to songs that are viable. You have to be able to step on a stage and be magical. When that's all there, everybody says, oh my God, he was an overnight success. No, that's all there and it just expedited the process. But the, but the, the attributes need to be there. And, and I think there needs to be honesty within the industry. I am not going to take your money if you don't have talent. I am not going to take your money if you don't have a, a viable song that I can get on playlists. Now, maybe that's altruistic. 
Maybe that's completely out there and, and everybody out there is saying, ah, the music business, that's bullshit, all that kind of stuff. I've lived my life 30 years in this business and I have to tell you, I have worked on artists that I didn't believe in. It never works. It never works. And that's why I've never, I never do it. I have never done it in years and years after I learned my lesson. Every word that comes out of your mouth is basically a lie. <laughs> you know, if you, it's, it's, it's sad for the artist. It's sad for, for my soul when I, you know, I want to be as excited about an artist as I possibly can be. When I sit down and I consult, when I sit down and I coach, I, I, I A and R my, my clients. I don't just take anyone on. And I'm fortunate and blessed that I have the ability to do that now in my career. Um, I, but I know I earned every, I, I earned that, you know, in, in, in the 30 years that I've been here. But when I find someone that's magical, when I find somebody that I think is gonna happen, I pull out all the stops because I believe the industry needs that individual and I believe that in, the individual needs the industry. It's totally, you know, wag the dog. You know, you're, you're either the flea or you're the dog and it, you take turns, you know. Uh, and, and, and that's an important part of, of uh, moving this industry forward and bringing more quality. Uh, the, the, the very fact that a, a podcast like this exists. I, I had to learn everything by mistakes, okay? There's so many more uh, resources now than ever before. Um, you don't really have an excuse to be ignorant. If you want to learn about publishing, you can go online and you can see 20 really, really um, good articles on publishing. I, I'm doing a, 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 a master class in, in, a, in a little while just on where your money goes when you're online, when your music is online all the different codes, the ISRC code, the ISRW codes, the IPI codes, all of those codes that are necessary for you to track your music and get paid. People don't know about that. People don't know about an ISRC code. You have to, you have to send that over. I would love to check it out and take it. By all means, um, I'll, I'll make sure that, that you, you know about it. It's, it's really, a, it's a new business. And um, I, I'm, I'm really on the, the soapbox for this one uh, because there's about four or five layers between the creator making that song and ultimately getting paid. And each of those layers are taking a cut. Now, right now it's essential because that's the way the, uh, the internet and music rolled out. It, it, it was an, a, totally an inexact science when it first started. The music industry had no idea that the internet was going to be so powerful and copyrights came in and the Music Modernization Act has helped an awful lot, uh, but there is still, how do we deal with sound exchange and ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and then song trust as, you know, what's an administrator in a publishing company? People don't have a clue what's going on here and, and I'm on a quest to make sure that, that they do. and. And I, I see just by looking at all the different episodes of your podcast that you're on that quest too. And I'm so happy to hear that. Um, I think knowledge is power. And I think artists become more powerful when, when they learn. And, you know, and, and so I, that's what I'm dedicated to, you know, in, in, in this, at this stage in my career as a consultant. And I'm about to launch a, a, a really big publishing company uh, that, that has a, a new model performing rights organization attached to it. Uh, I, I, I wish I was at liberty to give the name, but I will, I will let you know the minute I can. But basically, it will collect all the royalties. It will give you a dashboard for you to check it, but here's the beauty. You'll get paid in 60 days. Wow. And, and it's, it's all computerized, it's all algorithms, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we, 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 have to, we have to look at, you look at black box royalties. That's billions of dollars. Those are royalties that have been earned and, and the, the, the DSPs don't know who they belong to. Yeah, there's a lot of money out there for that. Oh my Lord. And, and 
you know, and, and, and it, the interesting thing also, Lenin, is that even though the United States is responsible for 20% of, of that, of that uh, uh, royalty, or of those royalties, it's 60% of the total value. So what that, and, and you could look at that, that statistic in a, in a very interesting way. It means that 80%, which is the rest of the world, is playing music for free most of the time. That's, that's astounding. It is. Now, we're not talking about the UK. We're not talking about Australia. We're not talking about, and I, and I use the term industrialized company, uh, countries loosely. We're not talking about that. We're talking, think about this world and think about music. I, I can be in, in uh, Ethiopia or I can be in Japan or I can be in Malawi or I can be in Bonaire and I'm still listening to music. ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, are they there? I don't think so, <laughs> you know. Uh, how are you getting paid if your music is being played there? And, and, and this is even a problem with big stars. So you can imagine what, what the, the smaller peeps are doing. And, and when you're growing too, you know, when you start to pick up steam, you need to know what's going on out there. And unless your music is coded properly, you're never gonna know. No. You know, so I've been really de devoting myself to a lot of educational um, efforts in, in that area, especially in the publishing area, actually, because I, as, as you, you pointed out with, with your, your uh, reference to sync licensing, I think music publishing is probably the, uh, the, the, the least um, obvious and exposed method of, of income. I think it's also one of the most confusing. I know I before I know a lot about like the the master royalties and how those are collected, but when it comes down to publishing royalties and music publishing, it's a little more complex because it's not as talked about as, you know, the artist royalties. Right. Right. And you know, the difference between streaming and downloads in terms of how they are counted by the RIAA. And I usually use that as a quiz when when I do um, keynotes and, and other addresses. No one realizes that it takes 10 downloads to equal one album sale or 1,500 streams to equal one album sale. And that's how the RIAA calculates now. Not many people even realize that. It comes down to the question of has music been devalued because 1,500 streams, well, there's not even 1,500, there's only 15 songs on the album or 10 songs on an album. That's right. That's right, and, and, and that, that's right, that scale is skewed. You're, you're, I totally agree with you, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, we, we go back to the, to the ASCAP, um, it was an ASCAP lawsuit, I think it was against Spotify, it, might, it may go back even further than Spotify, but they used as the test case of the, the track um, Royals by Lord. And she, and she had roughly 10 million spins on terrestrial radio and made approximately $900,000 in, in, in play royalties, you know, performance royalties. Those same 10 million spins or, or streams, whatever you want to call it, would have, would have yielded about eight or $9,000, maybe $12,000, you know, and, and it was a landmark case that, that kind of led to the Music Modernization Act on down the line. But still, because we're dealing online in a, in a TV broadcast model, meaning the labels supply content and the DSPs sell advertising, it's, it's the TV model. It's very different than a, a spin which is in and of itself an, you know, an entertainment entity. It's not just content. You know? So now music has turned into content on these DSPs. The labels are in good position because the labels are supplying the content. Okay? They're, they're basically the equivalent to the TV company or the film company that's making that show. You know? So they're okay, but the artists have over the, the course of the last several years, been getting less and less of, of the piece of the pie. Now, I think that's changing in that uh, entertainment lawyers are starting to understand the, uh, the dynamic 
and they're setting up uh, better um, royalty structures and compensation structures with, within the, con the contracts. So I, I think we're, we're going to see more, um, more equality there, more equity there. But it's still, if, if we're dealing with 1,500 streams and, and dealing with 10 downloads, I mean, your point is so well taken. There's rarely more than 15 songs on a, a, on a quote unquote album. So we, we've, got, we've got to get involved on, on, a, on a more logical basis. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? Sometimes what artists make is, is astronomically out there. I mean, some of the, the, the millions and millions of dollars that I've seen artists make uh, is, is pretty extraordinary. Uh, but, and, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying Lord didn't make great money on, on Royal. She did beautifully. But, but we, we still need to be able to allow our musicians to make a living. They have to make a living at least. And, and if they're content with $100,000, um, that's good. If they're not content with $100,000 and they're interested in a million or beyond, then, then you, you got to step up your game, you know? But, you know, what about the working musician that just, you know, wants the gig, uh, you know, wants to just have their own music and, and just have, you know, small fan base? Um, they're, they're not looking for the national stage. Maybe they're looking for a local or regional stage. You know, they, they need to be able to do it too. It's almost impossible the, the, the way the system is set up. Yeah, it's, it's confusing because, and I, I concur with a lot of the, the artists because a lot of them, they just get, they start learning, they start digging in like, oh, I want to learn the business and they start getting inundated with all there is to learn about music publishing, copyrights, the two different types of copyrights, sync licensing, artist management, A&R, and they just like what each one does and it's just like... They're, they just get so inundated and it's confusing and then how to collect all of your royalties and how, all the money. Like, I, I agree. Like, I think there should be one simple method to be like, you can log on to one dashboard and see all of your revenue, performing rights, your mechanical royalties, your artist royalties, sync licensing royalties, all that stuff. The technology to, to make that happen is incredibly, inc incredibly expensive, Okay. But you know, I, I think I, I think it's long overdue, and I think it's going to be you know received wildly, you know, from a successful point of view. Um, but until then, uh, I, I do feel that artists, songwriters, need to know a little the, the basics, you know, and and we are we are their conduit to that information, and and we have an obligation to get it right as well. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation in the music in, in the music business. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet. Um, you know, people do a, a search, and the first thing that comes up, they think it's telling the truth. <laughs> you know, and not necessarily the case. You have to vet this. There's a wonderful book called uh, "The Death of Why," and it's about that. It, it's about how kids are doing their homework online, and you know, they're they're using facts that aren't real facts. You know, and the teacher, where'd you get this? You know, oh, I got it at the, you know, the Ajax fan scene. You know, it's like, what? You know, or, or a, an opinion piece. They, they get, they think it's fact. Um, it's the same with the music business. We have to make sure that there's fact. I mean, that, that was the reason why I decided to write a book, um, which is, is coming out in the fall. I, I've been asked to write a lot of, you know, tell-all books, you know, on the music industry, on Madonna, on, you know, just the behind the scenes. And I've always passed on it. The book that, that, that I'm, I'm just finishing up uses stories to explain principles within the music business. Like a simple phrase like catch and kill. You know, it, it, it's not just a, 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 you know, a, a, a scandalous book that's, that's now in, in all the, the, the bookstores. Catch and kill is what labels used to do. Oh, it started kind of in the disco era when, when uh, certain labels would just sign people so that they didn't have to release them and they cut down on the amount of uh, competition they had. So I give stories to explain what catch and kill is. I give stories about a pay or play clause. I, and, I, and I'm using people like, and I'm very blessed that they, they consent to, to work with me on this, people like um, Linda Perry, uh, Carrie Keys, uh, Leslie Ann Jones, a, a lot of really good music people 
that, and there, there are more to come. Gary Katz, who produced all of the Steely Dan stuff, um, I'll, be, I'll be talking to, to people like Sylvia Rohn. These are the people that are going to bring a voice to the facts that up and coming artists need to know. How does this music business work is a very, very important aspect of, of my quest while I was, while I'm here and, and while I'm still actively involved in the entertainment industry. Absolutely. And I, me, on behalf of, I'm sure, all of the people listening will thank you and thank you for putting out credible, factual information on the music business. Because I, like I said, I see a lot of myself in you. You want, I want to learn a lot about everything. And I only want to put out the correct and factual information because I know what it's like to be naive in the music industry. There's so much to learn and I don't want to be able to search for something on Google and have to use the first thing that comes up because it may not be factual. I want to know, get to a point where I can point out like, no, that's not correct. That's not how you collect your royalties or playlisting. That's not correct. You, you mean... You, if you automatically generate it, if you're placed in a Spotify playlist that has 10 million followers, you're going to make a living for the rest of your life. That's obviously not true. So, and it comes back to a point. I used to work at a, a, a PR firm and it was like a little boutique one. And the, the person was kind of, was freelancing for him and they were kind of taking anything and everything because it was bringing in a paycheck. And I got sent over a blog campaign because it they wanted like, I had to get like six different blogs, seven different blogs, which I had a lot of connections at blogs at the time. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. But when I listened to the track, it was very, very bad. And I thought, I can't pitch this. This is not a good song. I It would ruin my integrity to the people that I have connections with. And it's giving these people false hope. Like you're going to charge them $500 or whatever it was to for me to pitch them and then not see results. I don't that I just couldn't do it morally. I just wasn't able to do it because the song just it was mixed very poorly, it was mastered very poorly, the production was not good, the melody, I mean things were out of key and it was just like I can't I just can't pitch this. So I had to, I had to decline I'm like I can't work on this. If you have another campaign I can take that one, but you need to tell this artist that we can't take this campaign because it's the, the song is just not good. Good for you. I think that's that's commendable and and admirable, and I think it's it's very important. You know, there there was a time in the business. I think it's less now, but do you know what a go see is? Go see. I I feel like I've heard the term, but I don't know. It's it, it's basically a middleman or woman who sees a young artist and says, you know, I have an in with so and so in A and R, and for three thousand dollars, I can get you in. <laughs> and and basically. Sometimes the person at the label and the middle person are working together and they usually split the money and it, there's, it's not, not, there's not going to be a deal. But that, that young artist thinks, my God, my, my, this is my big break. You know, that's, to me, that's, that's cruel. You know, it's cruel and inhumane and, and, and all those things and in my wildest dreams. And, you know, I've, I've had mentors and, and, and people in my life that have, have thought, like, Camille, you're too soft, you know. But you know what? I, I'm still in this business. I, I'm still viable. I'm, I, I'm respected. I have a great rep. You know, all these things are very much more important to me than I'm, than I'm splitting $3,000 with somebody for 15 minutes of work, you know, right. where I sit there and I, I blow smoke up somebody's butt and, and tell them they're fabulous and they're not, and then they walk out the door and I don't even remember their name. You know, and, and various genres of music use that a lot more than others. Uh, but it, a knowledgeable young artist wouldn't fall prey to that. But you, you see the problem, and, and, and you know it as well as, as I do, and I have moments in my career, and I'm sure you did too. If you want that dream so much, you're willing to do anything for it. And you're willing to believe anything for it. You know, and, and, and people fall prey to that. And what I try and do is I just try and keep people safe uh, with, with the business. And, you know, if they say so-and-so called and they want me to do this, this, and this, I, I check it out for them. I make sure that it's real, that it's legitimate. And, and th thankfully, a lot of the times it is, you know. 
But on the, the, the moments when it isn't, it, it still shocks me like it's the first time I ever uncovered it because I can't believe somebody would do that. You know, I, I know artists, successful artists, when they first started out, they did things like, you know, their mother and father mortgaged the house to, to get them into the studio. You know, and, and, and that's to be commended and protected. You know, and, and, I, and I, think that, I think this generation of music executives have, they have some soul. They have, they have wonderful moral and ethical fiber. Um, and and it, it makes me smile. And I want to make certain that the next generation understands. We're dealing, dealing with living, breathing commodities here. We're dealing not with products. And, and too often the industry dehumanizes people. Their, pro their product, they're, you know, I'm dropping you tomorrow. Wait a minute, I have three kids and, and a mortgage. Yeah. You know, what do you mean you're dropping me? You know, it, they, these are living, breathing commodities and, and they have feelings and they have families and, and we know how closely your, your brain and your soul and your heart is to the creative process. So they, they require some care and feeding. You know, and they and they require um, a, a, a an infrastructure of people um, that respect them and 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 protect them, um, or don't or give them opportunities to not need protection at all. That, that, that meaning that they they give a safe environment. That's why, I like some of the, the the smaller labels now, the deals are nice. They're straightforward. They're easy to understand. They're five or six pages. It's not fifty-six pages of legal legalese. You know, it's it's all very clean and and easy. I work with a series of lawyers. We always have some very nice, straight, um, understandable contracts to give to people, so that it's not a mystery. You know, I think that's so important right now. That everybody get a get a fair shake, especially with what's going on here. Um, a lot of people are looking at this this pandemic as a reset, um, a, a chance to re look, review, and and look at ways of, that you've been doing things. And maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a more humane way. Maybe my altruism is just off the charts, and I'm completely unrealistic. I don't know, but I seem to have done okay with 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 those attributes. Uh, so I'm not about to, to, you know, to change them now after being here and, and, and surviving the music industry for 30 years, you know. Yeah. And it comes to, you know, when I, when I rejected that, that campaign, I felt good because I knew in the bottom of my heart, like I, you know, when I was, I went to school for music production, I am a musician. I know what a good track sounds like. And when I'm reviewing something, I know what it takes to, to get featured on one of these big you know, publications. And with, with independent artists these days, $500 is a lot of money. That's money they could spend on new piece of gear. That's money they could spend on studio time. And that's money they could spend on their families. And to just be able to take that money and get them me a, a blog post or not get any blog post for that campaign, it, it would, it would morally ruin me because I, I just couldn't do it, and to 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 for people to be able to take advantage of artists like that, it, it's sickening to me, and it's heartbreaking because they don't think of those things that they have a family or they could put that money into studio time or investing more into their craft. I would much rather them invest that time and money that they're spending on that blog campaign into studio time to get a better recording, to learn, you know, maybe purchase a course on how to, how to learn how to record something, you know, or invest it back into their craft. Right. Right. I mean, I, I don't manage anymore. I haven't managed for years. Um, but I consult to a lot of managers and I coach a lot of people who aspire to manage, but primarily, you know, I, I also, I also work with a lot of young artists and, and my, primary objective is to make sure that they understand um, how the business works and and saving time money and and your your heart you know it's it's a very emotional business I mean you don't get on that stage and sing your heart out with you know it, it's not void of emotion you know this is this is a business where people are that you are your music when you're an artist so when when I say your music sucks I'm basically saying you suck 
you know, uh, and 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 so there need, there's there's the care and feeding of the artist that I still believe so staunchly in, and and it was the reason why I I loved the managers when when I was at Columbia and Epic Records because I I saw how they fought for their artists. Some some of them don't get me wrong. Some of them were were absolute um, champions. And others weren't, you know, but, but I mean, that holds true in every business sector, not just ours. Some people are better at what they do or others. Some people are more honest than others. Some people are more uh, understanding. That's the business. And what you do is you find the right fit, you know. But artist management to me and, and artist managers are the heartbeat of this business. If you look at some of the greatest heads of record companies, they usually were managers. You see some of the most successful people in the, in the music business, they were managers. Why? Because they had to know a lot about a lot of different businesses. And, and that's what we're dealing with now. We're, you know, and I know we're coming, we're coming full circle here, but that's what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with, uh, with blurred boundaries between businesses, okay? The arts entertainment is now one big sector and all of the different types of, of entertainment entities, they're intertwined now. Whether it be film, whether it be TV, whether it be endorsements for, for products, uh, advertising, gaming, all of this. And they all need music. When you're an artist manager, you're a business manager. An artist is a business. And business managers have to know everything about their business. They have to know about the, the product that they're selling. They have to know about what the product can do. They have to know the finances. They have to know how those finances are coming in. They have to know the budget. They have to know customer, customer support. Everything has to come in full circle. So when you're an artist manager, you have to know everything about that artist and what is going to be best for the artist. Absolutely. I liken it to being the CEO. When you're the manager, you're the CEO and the, and the product is the artist. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the way a CEO runs a company is the way you have to run that artist's career. You, you have to understand the finances. That's why you have that business manager there. This harkens back to the, to the artist development team. That's your executive branch. That's the, that's the C-suite for an artist manager. Uh, they, they tell you, hey, I, I don't profess to know accounting. I don't ever want to know accounting. You talk debit and credit, you know, and all the saliva in my mouth dries up. But I, but I have somebody that I, I could sit down and say, let me ask you this question. And that individual will give me specific information relevant to what I'm trying to do with my artist, with my client, my coaching client or my consulting client. And that's, that's a gift. You know, to, to know as much as you know is a gift, and to know when you don't know something is a gift too, and you can find somebody that has the correct answer. I think that that's very important. And I see artist management as the, um, it's, it's the spearhead now of, of the music business. It's, it's, it's when you, you, you see a Billie Eilish and you, and you move her forward, or, or, or you see what happens when there isn't good and strong management, and, and we, we waste a talent like Amy Winehouse. You know, there's, a, there's an obligation of the people around these artists to make sure that they stay safe. Now, if they look, if they're self-destruct, they're self-destruct. There's not much we can do about that. But on my watch, I'm going to do whatever the hell I have to do to, to try and make that work and, and fix the situation. I, 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 we've lost too much talent. Yeah, especially recently. I mean, Avicii, Chester Bennington, there's just, just too much that has we have lost to mental health issues. And I talk a lot about mental health. In fact, one of the first episodes on the podcast was with a mental health counselor. And I want to get more into that because I, I find that mental health specific to the music industry is very difficult to find. I agree. And it's so important because this industry, especially for artists who are touring 160 to 200 days a year, is absolutely taxing on their mental health. I agree completely. In 2003, I, I believe so strongly in what you just said. In 2003, I went back to school and I got a, I got a degree in, in, in psychology. Wow. You know, I, I wanted to understand more. I wanted to understand that self-destruct mechanism that happens sometimes or that desire to perform. 
You know, just a bit, I, I think I'd like to, you know, step on stage in front of 20,000 people, sing and have them judge me. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to think about that a little bit. You got to think about the, the, the psyche and, and they, they have to do it. They have to sing. They have to perform. They have to express their, their creativity. And I commend them for their, their fearlessness and I would protect them with my life. And I have. You know, it's 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 very important. I am I am so pro artist, and will be an, an, until I close my eyes for the last time. Because I there is no business without the talent, and they are sadly they are sometimes the most abused. Absolutely, and I mean you look at you look at artists like Justin Bieber and Britney Spears. I mean Justin Bieber just went through like a two-year hiatus where he had kind of a come to Jesus moment and he was struggling with with drugs and alcohol and he he came back and now he's back and releasing music again but I can imagine somebody at his age becoming so successful and so huge so quickly that the fame and the fortune just just got to him and he's being pulled in 50 different directions and he's still a kid trying to enjoy his his youth and his younger years and that was basically stripped away from him because he had people who were like that needed to make some money and were like you're trying to build a career and you're a musician and he's this multi-talented artist and I, I just can't imagine what that does to somebody's mental health. Well, you know, it's it's speaking truth to power. You know, he, this artist is responsible to, for for everyone's paycheck that's around them. So it's really easy to become a yes person. Yeah. And sometimes no is what they need to hear. Now, could you lose your job? Sure, I've lost my job saying no. But back to what you said earlier, I slept better that night. You know, I've I've always spoke the truth, always. And, and I continue to do that. And, and it's, it's important. And when you get an artist that wants to hear the truth, that's when a really good working relationship starts to take place. You know, the fame and the fortune, it's there. It exists. There's power in that person. Why not make that person completely helpless? Because whoever is surrounding that person then inherits the power. You know? So it, it, it's... It's an unhealthy situation to start, but this is, this is the star mechanism. This is the star machine that the United States of America has absolutely perfected, you know? And, and it's, it's people, you know, one of, one of my, I think, I think one of the best managers out there um, is, is Irving Azoff. And, and you, you want to know why I, I, I'm, I'm sure of it? is because his clients love him. His clients trust and love him. And they, and they stay with him and, and, and years go by and it's still, if you see them and, they, and they, they converge, it's a hug, it's this. It's because he was honest with them. It's because he protected them. And, and there are many artist managers out there like that. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm honored to be counted among them. But we have an obligation to take care of this natural resource that we call talent. And, and if an artist tells their manager that, hey, this touring schedule is too much, I need a break, it, the, the manager should not come back. Oh, come on, you've only got two weeks left. No, if the artist is saying, I need a break, give them a damn break. They are at their breaking point, and who knows what can happen from there. They need to take time to themselves, whether that be getting some rest, whether that's seeking a therapist, or spending time with their loved ones, their kids, their families, whatever that may be. And I've seen that quite a few times where the, the manager just pushes them and pushes them. And I, who, I, I, I want to say it was Avicii who he was, his manager was not taking care of him and just pushed him and pushed him and pushed him and pushed him. And pushed him. And that came out after his passing and his family came out and they said that he was always a very fragile person. He was never one for the spotlight and his manager just pushed him and pushed him and continued to push him. And it, look what happened. It ultimately ended up to him ending his life. And we lost one of the most talented electronic artists in the modern history of electronic music. And we don't get that chance back. But you know, it's not only just the manager, you know, it's the agent and booker, it's the label. You know, there's always a fiscal reason for all this. 
you know, and sometimes it's the manager looking the artist dead in the eye and saying, look, your lifestyle is so expensive. If you don't continue on this tour, you're not going to be able to afford to live the way you live. And, and it's about right sizing and it's about being, being logical, but it's tough in this business. Uh, Lennon, it's, it's hard for artists to stay, to keep things in perspective, to right size everything. Again, I don't know how anyone could fall asleep after going into a stadium and then having 65,000 people chanting your name and applauding and screaming and yelling. How do you go to sleep after that? How, do you, how does the adrenaline come out of your body? How do you, how do you not believe your press? And uh, and then you got people, you know, sending you messages on social media and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and you got the press is reviewing you and judging you, and you've got local news stations talking about you, and you're getting all these different things coming in, and then in two days or the day after, you got to do it all over again to get a whole new round of people tweeting and messaging you and press covering you and all that stuff. It's just like a never-ending cycle of constantly being judged. It's a tough life, you know, and... I, I always say to myself, if my kid came to me and said, you know, mom, I, I want to be in the music business. I, I don't know what I do. <laughs> you know? As an artist, the, the business side, I'd be fine. But the artist side, it was like, ooh, that's scary. Yeah, it's it's scary. Um, so coming, coming back a little bit, I want to touch on you managing Madonna because you started managing her like right before she kind of really exploded. You know, when she released like Like a Virgin and True Blue, what, how did you get on that? And I know you touched on it a little bit, but how did you get into managing her and what, what's it kind of like and how long did you manage her for? Um, I was, was over, over three, three, four years. It was, um, she was living illegally in the music building where I, where my studio was. She knew I was the only person in there that had music industry contacts. So she went on a little campaign and pursued her, her interactions with me. And um, I went to see her live and I signed her on the spot. <laughs> wow. On the spot, I knew. And then when, when you, you stopped developing her, what, what had she kind of accomplished and how did you kind of pass her on or what kind of happened there? She had absolutely nothing. She was legal, living illegally. She didn't even have an apartment. She was living in one of the studios, one of the guy's studios. She, didn't, she was kind of with a band called The Breakfast Club, but they were terrible. And, um, and, and basically, you know, I brought her into the mainstream music business, hooked her up with a killer band, and, um, you know, I mean, and I'm talking about a killer band like David Bowie's bass player and Susanna Vega's guitarist and, you know, uh, David Frank from Susu Studio Writer as the keyboard player. I mean, I just surrounded her with mainstream music industry and um, they, they reacted. But, it, but, you know, I mean, I'd been in the business for 10 years, so I took all of my contacts and I just laid them at her feet and they went... Huh, this is going to be something very special <laughs> and very and big. It abs and, and it absolutely and was. I was 32 years old. Um, I had a little bit of experience as a manager, but I've owned, I owned a great studio and I had record company experience. So the powers that be in the music business said, well, we're going to have to give it to one of the good old boys. And so it, it was embroiled in a lawsuit and craziness. And you know, the, the book explains the backstory of that. Um, but uh, and and it gives the facts because there's a there's a lot of urban legends surrounding the whole thing. But you know it's it's I spent four years at Columbia and Epic Records, and twice a week I would sit in, in meetings to pick singles. I honed my ears, I honed my eyes, and when that girl walked into my life, I knew what was there. Now, I got to tell you, the music business needed some convincing, all right? And, and, but I knew that if they saw her on stage, that they would go after it. But I knew, it was, I knew the weakest link in the, in, in the Madonna chain was going to be the, the music of it. She's probably one of the greatest performers to ever exist on the planet. And that's what people get. There's a lot, there's a lot of great inside stories that, that the book shares uh, that kind of adds... Uh, flesh onto the bone and, and people will understand that that part of my career yeah and there's the learning aspect of it as well as I said early on it, it's funny because uh, I've 
recently been getting into to RuPaul, and they always talk about uh, Madonna on there. They're doing, uh, they're doing like Madonna looks throughout the decades, and they're doing uh, reenactments of some of her performances and her choreography. And they've got to get into character, and it's it's a lot of fun. So when I saw that you were working, you worked with Madonna, and kind of kickstarted her career into what she is today. It, it was like I was like, I'm going to be really, I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. It 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 was it was a perfect match and and the, we built a strong foundation for her career early on and it's it's you know managed the test of time you know and, and the truth of the matter is she's an icon you know a lot of people call artists icons right now are they really icons have they really changed uh the fabric of our society culturally she has you know, and, and, and the book goes into that too, icon or, or superstar. And it, it, I tell you, it's so funny, it's turned into kind of a dinner party conversation now. Who's a superstar? Who's an artist? Who's an icon? You know, is, is, uh, um, is Gambino, is, 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 is Gambino a, a superstar or, is, or an artist? Is Billie Eilish a superstar or is she an icon? You know, all of these things. So there's, there's so much you know, that, that we could talk about. And I'm, we, we've gone over, I apologize. Um, we had an hour. I think we're over that hour. Aren't oh, no, no. I, I go for as long as the conversation goes, um, unless the, somebody has a time limit. But I'm, I'm totally open to hour and a half, whatever it is. So th- this has been great. This is, I've gotten so much information, and I'm so glad that we're connected. And I, ho- I hope to continue to stay connected and, and share resources with amongst each other because we both share the same vision for the modern music business, and that's to keep uh, musicians and people in the business educated and keep things factual. How can listeners keep up with you and what you're doing and, and reach out to you if they have any questions on anything you said? Okay, there's my Instagram account, Camille Barbone Coaching. Uh, you, you can reach me through there. You can also email office at camillebarbone.com. Uh, and the website is www.camillebarbone. Uh, it's all there for you, you know, and you can, pretty much everybody can find me. You know, you just have to, if you Google search it, you, you, you'll get Dawn first, but then you'll get to me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, so I'll put all of that information in the show notes as well so people can easily access it and reach out if they have any questions. So I just want to say thank you again so much for your time today and all of the information that you shared. My pleasure. Uh, 